Yeah, so I only own this home uh -huh. in my name, but over like the massive bull run that we had yeah. that the stock stock market just like took off. Yeah. I took those gains and I went into like a partnership yeah. with a buddy of mine Good that venture. does, yeah. he does like real estate investing and he basically uses other people's money. So are you like a debt partner basically towards it? I'm basically like the money portion. So we opened up an LLC. Yeah. But you're like, you're getting paid on the debt. Do you actually own the house? Yeah. We both own the house. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So we opened up an LLC. We both are on it. He does all the numbers. He finds the homes. Sure. He uh, does all the numbers to make you're, sure. You're like, a passive investor. Ultimately. I'm a passive investor. I just yeah. supply the money. He doesn't yeah. put any of his capital up front. Oh, really? But he's putting in all the work. Yeah. So what's the split, though, on the earnings? Like the 30? split is uh, I get paid out for my initial capital. Uh -huh. And then whatever the profits are, we split 50-50. It's not a bad deal he got for a, him. He got a great deal. Yeah, he got a great deal because like yeah, I don't most, know. Yeah, because most like general like on syndications like most general partnerships, if you say you're built just for at scale like a ten million dollar apartment unit, right? You mm -hmm. would raise the capital of ten million dollars, but you take a thirty percent equity partnership as a general partnership to operate it. Got it. So okay. it's thirty percent to operate, but you are doing the maintenance, finding the tenants, like yeah. doing the work like that. But it's usually around like thirty percent. So he got a great deal. You're a good guy. I'm gonna hit you up next time <laughs> I, I mean, need some money. These were house. these were small scale. These were single family homes. Yeah, I mean just in general. Yeah. yeah. So and if I it's mean, a friend of yours, it makes it's it easier a to be fifty fifty. Yeah. Yeah. I mean we did we did pretty good. We're trying to let go of the last one right now. So you're paying out to profit. So let me ask you about the mm. a couple things under the top line uh so like do you pay property management fees no okay so he's the property manager effectively he's the property manager i think on one property we might have done property management just because he was getting overwhelmed yeah because yeah, i course. wasn't the only person he did this with he had two other partnerships yeah um but the other two was just him just him yeah he probably regrets that though because what because yeah. he had to deal with all the tenants. Yeah, I would <laughs> never go unless there's somebody else managing it. I would not yeah. buy real estate. Yeah, it's worth what you pay for it, especially yeah. if it's uh, going to be something very passive of yours. Yeah, and yeah. literally, I had to do nothing. Yeah, you know, I just for you, yeah, kept it makes up a lot with of sense. it. Yeah, I called him, learned. Yeah. You know, I mean, he ran all the numbers. I, yeah, you know, I don't know the formulas he uses to calculate if it's a good deal or not. Yeah, but every single time they worked out, every single time after repairs, they appraised for Listen, probably over what we if estimated. You're, if you're netting money every month, it's a good, it's a good real estate investment. Yeah, this. <laughs> so our issue with this, this one that we have right now is we bought it with a tenant already in. Sure. They're on fixed income. Sure. They pay every month, but they can't move out, and we're it's hard to sell with a tenant in place. Oops, yeah. So you're trying to you're trying to dispose you're trying to get rid of the property. Yeah, we're trying to let it. We're trying to are liquidate act, everything. Are you putting it on the MLS? Uh, he is. He yeah. is, and with mm -hmm. the PNA, yeah, well, I'll just. I mean, there is people that will buy it yeah. with the tenant in place, but it's at it's going to be at a cost. Mm -hmm. Right. Co yeah. That yeah, doesn't... you're gonna have to lose. You're gonna have to see what you guys need. I mean, if you're really interested, I have investors that would yeah. at least submit cash I'll, offers. Yeah, I'll link you two up. I mean, he's yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, he's for sure. in the same business. He's moving on to apartments. This is why me and him are selling everything. We were going to try and accumulate to as many rentals to... as property. Yeah. But he says single family is too much work per door. He needs to go up to Well, I apartments. mean, yeah, you could look into uh, affordable housing concepts like pad split as well, where you mm -hmm. can take a single family home and increase the amount of bedrooms in it. And they actually mm -hmm. help you find tenants. Uh, per room at a weekly rental rate so you can take your three bedroom house turn into like a five bedroom house and you can accumulate revenue like that the construction costs seem kind of yeah heavy. i mean you do have to make an investment but mm -hmm. it, it's to do so but it does kind of uh mm -hmm. alleviate the issue of finding multifamily, which is what every investor really wants to do mm. or most want to do. You can transition a single family home into like a multi tenant property, um, you know, and, and get similar earnings and gains and benefits of it. Gotcha. So, yeah. Do you invest in real estate? Yeah, of course. Okay. So yeah. how many, if you don't mind, how many properties you got? Uh, so, I have partnerships like you okay. in a long way like you. 
I I own a few, so it totals in doors around seven. Okay. But um, I mean, what our co- company is most uh, um, focused on is flipping paper, which is like wholesaling. Wholesaling, yeah. Yeah. He did so, that for a little bit. Yeah. Oh, actually, you you and him would probably do well together because he he used to wholesale as well. Yeah, I think most... Um, and he has all those connections with all the people that do the same thing. Yeah, so. I mean, investing, like real estate investing is such an interesting place because a, a, a decent investor can still make a lot of money mm-hmm. if they just know you're the area pretty well and they're not lazy, Yeah, to be honest with you. So, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's in, in the career, the, the journey that like I've had through real estate, it's, it's quite fascinating because in three years, what I've realized is that the brokest people in real estate are the ones selling it. Mm. Like, you know, to make $300,000 a year as an investor, you need to be mediocre. Mm-hmm. To make $300,000 a year as a real estate agent, you have to be top tier. So, Got you it. know, it's a little bit different of a, of a process. And I think that's like, you know, the, the, the inception of teams into the market, into the market mm-hmm. and, and agents figuring out how to scale their resources so they can, you know, continually earn, uh, income off of sales that they're not no longer doing. Right. It's everybody mm-hmm. should find a way to take themselves out of the deal. A uh, big investor, you'll never leave the deal. You'll be hands on it and, and like scaling an investment. Mm-hmm. A company is a little bit, it's, it's possible. There's people that have done it as well. Yeah. But if you're the one going to hand and foot do things yep. in real estate, you should always get into the investment space because that's where you can make the most returns. Like mm-hmm. it's your same amount of time that you're investing, showing houses, knocking on doors. Like conceptually, the work amount yep. is the same, but the returns are much different, but it comes with a learning curve. So that's why people, it's not their first step. They usually start mm-hmm. as agents yep. and then learn inside out and then transition, which is like where I'm at because I've been at three years in the business. I'm not an agent. Yeah. I've never sold a house, right? So it's Oh, like, you're not an agent? No. Okay. Yeah. You just run a team of agents? Yeah, I run okay. the business. Yeah, exactly. So it, it just, it it's it's like learning it a little bit differently. Yeah. But it's interesting. So this buddy of mine that I had the partnership with, he yeah. did the same thing. He was an agent. Of course. Then he went into wholesaling yeah. and then he discovered partnerships yeah. where he can use other people's yeah, other money, people, leverage other people's capital, leverage other, other people's capital. Knowledge. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's conceptually the same. Now, you know, you'll find it in every type of individual. There's always a point where they are resistant to learning or the resistant, like it's like an agent. If you take an agent, cause uncomfortable. Once they get mm-hmm. good at something, they don't want to leave that space because they have a level of comfort. They know how they can make a living. But it, it's those like more conceptual like people, I guess you mm-hmm. could say, that could be like, wow, like I'm turning and burning, earning commissions. It's yeah. like, well, what if I just use this money to buy a property that will passively help mm-hmm. me earn commission as well or income as well? So, Yeah, those people who are driven by money probably do well in like real estate i think you know it's 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 a very egocentric place when it comes to being like a a representative of other people Mm -hmm. in terms of like a direct to consumer uh um kind of role like a real estate agent plays like you're literally always dealing with the consumer and then Mm -hmm. other agents and that's your peer group is the people buying and selling and other agents that you have to negotiate with right and Mm -hmm. um i think uh what happens there is once you get really really good at something you don't want to go back to being the rookie into pouring into the next space because you're going to go make those mistakes again and Mm -hmm. you're going to miss underwrite a deal and you're going to lose a capital partner like those things happen when you're learning you know and uh i think they just you know are comfortable to Mm -hmm. some some capacity and then you have the transient property where like people come like they're like real estate it's like Orlando in a lot of ways when it's like people come in and out of it all the time yeah. you know what I mean when the market's <laughs> good this. they transition in when the market's bad they transition uh-huh. out so like those that stick around you know gather market share but it becomes very interesting because it's like I'll go to a lot of these events and I'll do a lot of these things and you see these big ecosystems of agents right mm-hmm. and they're like you know X million dollars in sales X million I mean no one really talks about profit you know too yeah. often then if you go to like an investor mastermind, it's like, oh, like what's the cap rate? What's the earnings? What's yeah. the money in my pocket? It's like a totally different space, right? And it's like, well, the person 
are the type of individual who is stimulated by the regular real estate place mm-hmm. is not the same that's going to be like the more analytical yeah. individual so like the ego needs to be fed because it's it's part of the whole experience for them yeah you know so i mean i think you would need that to be a good real estate investor right just a little bit a little bit of ego and then honestly it's it's so bare bone like 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 just raw meat and potato numbers. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, you need to be effective on finding deals. You need to be effective on talking to people, underwriting deals. Like it's such a different pathway mm-hmm. compared to an agent. Like you're trying to build a omnipresence based brand. You're trying to do more like you're not going to see an investor buy a billboard. You know, mm-hmm. you may see one yeah. or you're not going to see an investor like do a charity event or do these kind of community based things that are with the direct consumer because in, in investors in a lot of ways it's like you really are looking at buying a scenario or pain as they call it you're okay. not really, yeah so like for example the 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 what i always say it's like no one walks into the mercedes dealership and goes to the finance office first mm-hmm. and then goes and shops they go find a house or a car and figure out how and they can afford it but like that's yeah. the person that the realtor's dealing with, the one, the one, the dreamer, you know, that person that's dreaming. The real estate investor is dealing with the person who's got liens and medical bills and <laughs> divorce and death and like all the, these real hard situations mm-hmm. in like this vacant. Like if I showed you a yeah. picture of a house we're looking at acquiring now, it's so disgusting. And even the person that brought the deal to me is like, they told me they were living in here because it looks uninhabitable. Yeah. Right. So it's like that's who you're dealing with primarily because you're trying to find a deal. You're trying to find a deal. Correct. Exactly. So like it's not it's not the same. Like mm-hmm. you're gonna have to, you know, it's still different in terms of the personality type, I would say. Yeah. And it's all about building relationships, right? Because people can hand you deals. I mean, my buddy has done this too, where he's known people that they found something that's a good deal, but they can't, they don't either don't have the capital to invest in it right now. And then just, you know, Hey, we found something good. We can't do it right now, but we'll give it to you. You keep us in mind for one that you find that you can't do. There's like always a way to make money on an opportunity in real estate in terms of like, whatever situation comes up there's even there's even ways to buy houses with no capital but you have to see if there's ways on their finance right the seller finance yeah. or subject to assume a mortgage like there's there's different ways to do it but it's only if it makes profitable sense yeah you know what i'm saying so someone might be skimming like throwing a deal away because for them and what they can offer to take down that deal it's not going to work and make money. So you mm-hmm. give it to the next guy who may have the potential or the capital to acquire a deal and bank on depreciation or write-offs. Like mm-hmm. some people buy houses not to actually make money like they do for depreciation, right? Like certain Trying tax to. incentives. So it's like you pass it on to that investor if the deal is so skinny that you yeah. can't get it done, you know? So I don't know, man. The first one we did was that scenario so a buddy of his found the place i think the guy so it was kind of like a um a hoarder this place was disgusting of course it's not sellable you can't market that house yeah exactly so i believe it might have been paid off because it was um (laughs) god i hope so yeah it was um is there any hoa liens no no hoas okay so we we all we did all our investing in like the secondary markets so this was in bartow Mm -hmm. and this was a house the parents died handed down to the son the son inheritance yeah Yeah. son couldn't take care of it it's very common a guy found this. He said, I'll sell it for, I think he's only sold it for 44000 Yeah. And this thing cleaned up area nice. It would have been like 180 So they, for some reason, couldn't take it on. They sold it to us for 60 70 something yeah, like that. So they, so they got a quick, easy. Wholesale, yeah. Yeah, wholesale. But I mean, that happens. I mean, like, you know, it's funny. I was talking to somebody about this. I can't remember who it was. I think my, my friend sean my buddy sean my partner sean Mm -hmm. and uh like there's a daisy train approach so i can get a deal if there's enough meat on the bone or much there's enough room for it i can lock down a deal for fifty thousand, wholesale to you Mm -hmm. for sixty thousand. then you can sign that contract to 
this person, there's nobody here, but this yeah. person over here for another 10,000. And like the person that's <laughs> actually makes buying a little it, bit of money. you don't even know. Like you, yeah. you said he found a deal. No, he actually could have been shopping somebody else's lockdown deal. Mm -hmm. and you really don't have an idea. I mean, maybe if you personally know him, it could be different, but you really don't know. Like yeah. it could be daisy chain down infinite amount of times. As long as there's a yeah. buyer at the end, it doesn't matter. <laughs> It's like how the market. Uh, what were those? What were those? Uh, those mortgage products that basically caused the crash of, of the market. They the were like ninja loans. No, the, the the collateral. It's like some some sort uh -huh. of. I can't remember what it, it was. A, a CD something. I can't remember what it's called. But there was a synthetic version of that, where you could bet like. <laughs> You were making a bet on the market whether or not if it would go up or down 10%, yeah. right? And maybe the spread would be $10,000. Well, I could place a $200,000 bet on that, you know what I mean, on yeah. your bet, which has nothing to do with the actual like buying or selling of the shares. Okay. It's just a gamble ultimately and they're, they're actually like – there's actually a thing. But that's basically, you know, if there's a buyer at the end of it, you mm -hmm. can really put – anything on top of a deal but obviously to some point it doesn't make sense anymore. yeah exactly yeah. like yeah. whoever that last person is better know what they're doing because you don't want to buy something and then i mean we know. represented like our, our company represented zillow during the zillow offers day and we bought and sold actually like a thousand homes for zillow during the <laughs> yeah. buyer uh thing and it was funny because um were they paying more were you were they it, getting... it fluctuated at okay. some point they're paying 15 to 20 cents uh below market uh, 20% below market value, 80 cents on the dollar. Sorry. Okay, saying. yeah, 80 cents and on the dollar. And then it got to the point where they were like, because they used... Uh, that's that's not enough That's not enough buffer, right? I no, mean, it is. I mean, like, if you're buying a home that doesn't need much repair, 80%. Okay. 80% if it doesn't need repair. If right, you're, then you're relisting it at 100%. Correct, it's just a quick okay. sale. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't mean they come in, they can... You so, can mobilize subs pretty easily for paint and basic things. Yeah. So they wouldn't buy houses that were too... Too, too like, messed too up, bad, okay, like bad we would shape, have. Right, yeah. so they started at, like, 20%, uh, like, less than market value. And then they were we, – we were scaled throughout the country. Like they, they partnered with these large teams and businesses like ourselves. And they um, – we equipped ourselves with like uh, um, comparative market analytics teams. So basically okay. the CMA teams. So basically they just do the comps and values of the houses as they come in. Okay. So it helped Zillow make their offer. Okay. Right. So if the house is a hundred grand, Zillow knows they're going to offer 80000 to the consumer see if they take it. So um, – they did that and they realized some of the it was almost a bottleneck having to have that human human power okay because we were we were paying for that locally we were taking that but it was in our negotiation to what zillow was offering us okay to do the sales for them so i think like they came with an algorithm which obviously like this is why data needs to be collected for a long period of time, right? But they, they came with an algorithm that would kind of calculate appreciation so they knew okay. like what the offer should be. And then when they disbanded the, using the local CMAs, they went to the algorithm because of what happened during COVID mm -hmm. in that previous sales data, like appreciation for a year. Yeah. From an 18-month period, if you go, you know, I don't know the exact dates, but in COVID, I have to look at the chart. Yeah. If you looked at appreciation, it was like your house was just going up. It almost like doubled. Like right? double. Well, not like doubled, but like 5 to 10 to 15% 15 gains yeah. on a 60-day window. It's yeah. like, this is crazy, right? This is a, That's crazy these are, these are assets that yeah. are hundreds of thousands of dollars right yeah. that's supposed to be a stabilized asset to some <laughs> some regard so like that's it's always going to appreciate over time so if you take an algorithm in the middle of that frenzy and you don't really know where the end is going to be right yeah. we didn't know until they announced there's going to be four rate kites we didn't know what they were going to be so zillow plugs in this algorithm all of a sudden they're it's offering 101 percent of typical sales price because the appreciation that was preloaded yeah. into the algorithm was saying, doesn't matter, it's gonna go it's gonna by like go 13%. Up. This is the way you win the deal. So that basically screwed up yeah. what happened with Zillow. They started buying houses overpriced, ruined the iBuyer program, mm -hmm. it crashed it down, and it's just like, the reason, the, you know, the, I don't even remember why we got into the conversation, but the, the concept was it was like, you know, you gotta, I don't even know what we're talking about, but I yeah. remember Zillow crashed. Like that's how they crashed it based on the algorithm. Of yeah, the that's kind of like offering. similar to what happened in 08 because everyone was buying houses with like zero down mortgages. Well, I think that's because a they bit... always thought it was going up, right? Well, like everyone assumed like it's just going to keep going up. I mean, kind of yes and no. It was more like people had way too much access to money. It was different during COVID. It was cheap to borrow money. 
Mm -hmm. but it caused natural inflation. So things got more expensive. And then in 08, it was just easy to borrow money, like over borrow what you're qualified for. So it was a little bit different because at least there's appraisal now contingencies during COVID to where when people were offering money Mm -hmm. over the asking price, it wasn't like through the collateralized loan. So like if you wanted to go 20 grand over, you had a buyer had to come with that out of pocket cash. You get what oh. I'm saying? So, so you know, it depends on what that appraisal gap is. So, like, say the house is listed for 450, mm-hmm. and the appraisal comes back at 430. The buyer needs to come up 20 grand, or the seller needs to come down 20 grand, or find some mutual in the middle of negotiation because mm-hmm. the bank's not going to certify the total amount. Yeah. In 08, that wasn't happening. Yeah, I 08, know. And then with the creation of mortgage-backed securities, which is supposed yep. to be something safe, right? The, these these terribly rated loans because yep. these poor consumer people that shouldn't have them these, were what getting they call it subprime loans subprime so, loans yeah. like B minus right <laughs> they were basically like loaded up mortgages that were being resold on the yeah that that people could not pay for that could not pay yeah. for and and that was really pushed forward because the loan officers were finding every possible way. I mean, mm. there's also political purposes on like, well, like acts that, you know, mm. that some presidents put an act that, you know, were yeah. anti-discrimination. So calls a lot of like anti-redlining and things like that, mm. which is, you know, I'm not saying whether it was right or wrong, but that mm. also did give a lot of incentives to loan officers to push to loans push, through yeah. and to keep things a little bit loose. Right. So, uh, the, the the funny part is Wall Street is very well. I don't know. I think it's all manipulated, but that's totally different. But Wall Street is we supposed to it. be yeah. <laughs> Wall Street's supposed to be like the straight up and down person, like it's by the book more or less. Yeah. But they were basically trading loans that at the inception point were done with people. <laughs> like it yeah. was, it's like so it's supposed to be all buttoned up at the top, but at the bottom is a complete shit show. So that obviously goes mm-hmm. up into there. So now they're selling assets and securities that are supposed to be secure but they have <laughs> like people that should have never bought that i'm just not gonna yeah. like i'm not gonna come down to any profession so i'm not gonna say anything but mm-hmm. people that shouldn't have had that house have that house yeah. ultimately you know so i mean my perception of wall street is what basically wolf of wall street was all about it's like those people at the top and i have a buddy that does um he does financial advising yeah they don't really care. I mean, they care to a certain extent what they're buying and selling. But as they long as care. they're buying and selling, just making money. they're making the commission. Mm-hmm. That's all they care about. You know, it's the same thing. They just gotta make their their uh, clients, you know, five percent, six percent, because they're right. handling millions, billions of dollars. Yeah, I mean, shit, Bitcoin went up like fourteen percent in the last yeah, like, I know. Yeah, So like, uh, like. I understand the game of the markets. It's just different assets that they're playing with out there. Yeah. But why, why do you think it uh, took a run recently? Dude, I can't even tell you why. I mean, yeah? they're saying a lot of things. I mean, one thing that I've been keeping an eye on is MicroStrategy. Yeah. And because every time they seem to purchase, <laughs> every time they seem to purchase Bitcoin. That shit goes down. <laughs> which is, uh, no, which is like they purchase it. No, they just bought. Like, they just bought before they just the run? bought before the run. Right okay, now, perfect, before this perfect. run. So like I don't know. I think I, they might I, just be on like I think they're in the green now. They were negative. No, no, they're up seven hundred million dollars on their on their purchases of but Bitcoin. But what's their but what's their um, I think from what I read today, that's their total. That's their total. That's their total earnings okay. on their holdings. But do you know what their uh oh my god, I'm forgetting the name now because I haven't traded in a while. Uh what their base price is or their average cost is? I don't know, but it, from Bitcoin? what I read they're up. Seven. They're up seven hundred. I mean, dude, it's on a blockchain. Like we literally can look it up if we want yeah, to. We just got yeah, another exactly. wallet to purchase, so I'm sure that. If, but from what I read, uh, I don't know. It was like some crypto news. It was like seven hundred million. But yeah, I watch them. I just I just buy like weekly on my on my on Bitcoin on Bitcoin and XRP are the two that I buy weekly. Yeah, I do the same. Yeah, the other ones I buy monthly. The other altcoins. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, just one time, smaller amounts. Yeah, yeah, I'm only I'm only in two right now, but the. I think it went up. It'll probably crash a little bit. It's so volatile, dude. It's, it's so gonna, volatile. It's gonna It'll probably crash. At least 50 to, it's 50, 60% pullback, I think, from where... It, you think it's going to do another 50%? I no, would love from, for what it it from what it oh, earned. From what it earned in the yeah. recent times. Yeah. From what so we're at the 50% mark, roughly, yeah, right, right now. now. Yeah. 
So yeah, but that none of that matters. None of that counts because it was artificially stimulated. It does. It doesn't. All the money that it was doesn't that. make. It, that's what I'm saying. But here's here's what I think. The the top level investors now, so the really rich people and the hedge fund managers and all of that, they're looking at this asset, especially Bitcoin, and thinking like, this is this is something that's investable because it can't be inflated like the dollar. Eventually, interest rates will have to come down. If, our government keeps selling treasuries, so they keep printing money. Yeah, That's basically another form basically of printing, printing money. money yeah. So, like, just look at, I think it's called the M2 money supply, which is the yeah. actual dollars in circulation. Yeah. That shit is just up and to the mm-hmm. right. So, They're I mean. Printing their way out of, they're printing their way out of it, yeah. Bitcoin's inflationary, but the halving's coming up, which means it's going to be less well, inflationary. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the static amount is what makes it that. But if that's the case, it, you know, it needs utility, because if that's the case then the big guy should just be buying gold. Yeah, well, gold... To some, to I some think degree. Gold's a lot harder because well, it's an actual no one, physical substance. Right? Know, I mean, and nobody knows how much it really is. Like yeah, everyone, and like, who knows it's, who it's finds mine. the next... Exactly. Yeah, so it's hard. Huge deposit where now there's like a huge ton of gold out there. And also it's hard to move around. It's heavy. You no, no, dig it. I'm not disagreeing with any of yeah, that. Yeah, Bitcoin's like So easy. Bitcoin could be looked at at that, that, that vehicle and asset that is what gold was for them exactly right? it could exchange it could, that the, that like properties of it it won't replace gold but i think it will match gold in market cap so yeah yeah because yeah. i think gold's 10 trillion it might be more now i mean look it, it, you can even look at this like this way like bitcoin for me it's very still shaky i'm very speculative on the whole thing because mm-hmm. it also grew through illegal money i mean the silk road put Mm -hmm. so much money in supply of bitcoin and made it investable and then when when it (laughs) went truth because it would still be so far behind Mm -hmm. if illegal transactions transactions didn't happen it wouldn't have the amount of circulation that did it wouldn't it would Mm -hmm. be like okay cool It, it could over time sure and then COVID happened as well so i think there was this like like Silk Road, when that got shut down at, at scale, like COVID was right around the corner two more years later. Mm-hmm. And so, I, I mean, I think, and I'm not saying whether or not, I still come down to the technology piece of all of them, yeah. all the projects. It's utility. Like, how are we going to use this in our life? Because it needs to have mm-hmm. an interface with us for it to make sense. So Bitcoin, I think, is the one that shouldn't have any utility. I think Bitcoin's the only one that's actually like it's store money. value. Yeah, store yeah, value. Yeah, it's the only course. one that I would consider money. Yeah, of course. Money doesn't have utility. A dollar doesn't have utility. It's just a means mm. of transaction. It mm. means I can give you this for something. <laughs> well, but we trade our energy, our time for it. Exactly. We that's trade our first, time. That's the first part of the currency. Exactly. But then it's also manipulable because you can untrade your time for it when you get good enough at the game. Yeah. And you can earn your time back. That's the whole kind of point. But I mean, other than that, it doesn't have utility other than I will trade time for it. Well, whereas something like a smart contract, it does have utility because you and I don't hunt for our uh food. You and I don't (laughs) create our own clean water. We don't generate our own electricity. Mm -hmm. That is the utility behind money. We take the energy for that utility because if not, you and I would be in a cave. Of course. Hunting for our own food. Or like, we, so we'd be bartering. It, it, correct. Right? Yeah. So it does provide some form of utility. I see I see what you mean. But what yeah. I mean by utility is something like what a smart contract can do. Sure. Like there's other things within crypto or I'm sorry, blockchain that you can do that's just not a means of like a unit of transaction. So like yeah. a smart contract can house other code in it that will how how's tons of things yeah. Yeah. yeah so i think that's the more utility part and when it comes to that that's when i get into the altcoins and then we can all yeah. <laughs> we can all fight over which one it is i don't know i mean i look at something like mastercard because i think you have to keep it as financial as you possibly can in order mm-hmm. in, in, for it to to have that like synthesis with us yeah. like in terms of our understanding of it it needs to stay in the financial space for now and this is why i like Solana, because it's the only one that's fast enough to meet the transaction speeds of of uh, things like Visa. Like, so, like Mastercard's like three point two seconds, something like that. Three point. Uh, I don't know uh-huh. what Mastercard is, but I know for Visa, they're doing like a hundred and fifty transactions per second. But I think you still need because speed is something that can come secondary to like scalability. 
because you can always develop for speed. But mm -hmm. is, if, if a product, like, I don't know, we could probably look it up. It's, there's probably like 268 billion MasterCard transactions in an annual year. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Two, So, like, you need to be able to run those. And those aren't just direct-to-consumer transactions. Those are mm -hmm. intermediate transactions between the other processes and banking systems mm -hmm. and back-end approach. Like, there's other layers of transactions. But this is why MasterCard and Visa, there's... Lo there's fees associated with it, of course. right? Because it has to, it has to have some kind of funds for all of that background. Correct. Well, how do they, how do they keep the infrastructure running? Exactly. Blockchain yeah, you, does it for fractions. It can. Fractions. It can. It can. And, that, but, and that's but, why I like to run the low fees. You, you definitely can. Of transactions. At the end of it. So, I mean, but it starts at the, you have to start at the root of it, right? So it needs to go into the banking system first, because mm -hmm. like a lot of this intermediate transactions are actually like, keeping credit alive which is the deposits and payments and things like that so there has to be like interfacing to that as well yeah the banks don't like it man of course the banks they don't aren't gonna like, like it, it because it cuts them out it, can, well. it cuts them out i mean when you send the when you send money through a wire or something like that it goes to like two or three banks just yeah to i mean swift, swift alone makes so much money i yeah. mean i pay a lot of, i have some overseas workers and we we use like wise or one of those transfer protocols and there's mm -hmm. a swift fee and there's a swift fee exactly it. yeah it's it's like if you that. did that on the blockchain it'd but be i mean i think it's because and we pay for we pay for accuracy and security you know all those extra layers mm -hmm. and 100 percent distributed ledger technology and blockchain technology can provide that validation to it but mm -hmm. You know, as as much as we hate to say, like, as people, like, even as, like, techies or whatever, and I'm not mm -hmm. much of a techie anymore, you know, yeah. I left that field a couple <laughs> years ago, but um, it's, it's like, we we want decentralization, yeah. so less control, but then we want centralization when something goes wrong. Yeah. But, I mean, this is, so, like, this is, like, everything, right? So, like... Yeah, I mean, it is Our everything. banking system is so centralized. Correct. It's like backstopped no matter what it does, like no matter how much it fucks up. Yeah. It's backstopped. You know, no matter how many <laughs> risky stuff. I mean, what was that thing with um, with the bank that almost went under or the Silicon Which Valley one? Bank? Silicon Valley Bank? Yeah. Yeah, they bought securities and then they, they tech bought, performed bad. Yeah, they bought uh, treasuries or something no, like that? I think they bought secu like MBA, uh, mortgage backed securities. Oh, did they? I, I think so. I thought they did. I could be wrong. I, I thought no they idea. bought long term government bonds or treasuries or something like that and that's when interest rates were low so they were paying shit oh, but then as right. interest rates started going up those things started to lose value i thought they bought maybe those because part short of the, term yeah, yeah was, of course you of know course. offering way more well i think what also happened is the tech earnings went south and so people that's had true. to access access the, yeah. the, the money to make the payroll and stuff yep. and that's what created like the micro bank run but i think and that's where papa jerome came in was just course, like dude hey to, we'll, <laughs> all the money you need <laughs> and we are fixed taxes <laughs> milk is up guys yeah. we gotta pay for this bank to get back dude that's why like i don't know for me bitcoin is it's not speculative anymore for me it's not I, it's so hard. No one can manipulate it. I mean, look, I mean, they might be able to manipulate the price. Here's the, here's the best thing about the world: mm -hmm. death. Because <laughs> eventually, people of our age and our our mindset are going to be the ones running the show. Exactly. That's when this shit's going to enter. Yep. You know. But I mean, like, we got to wait for these people to fucking die. So. But they won't fucking die. <laughs> yeah, no. They won't yeah, fucking no. Die. I mean, over time, their brains will I mean, decay. Joe Biden's <laughs> damn near eighty. Can't speak. Can't walk. I you mean, know. I think. I think there is a. Uh, you know, I always tell this to people that are like when they say like i'm not competitive because like mm -hmm. i i know i'm very competitive you know and um the, the irony in it why i laugh is talking about it's like a dude like you were the first sperm to get to the egg like <laughs> at some point of your inception you, you won were. a competition yep. like don't let that flame <laughs> die brother you know what i mean we should keep it going like to some point oh my god that's like the best analogy yeah I've but like heard. we've always been a so i think this world beats us down because it's like shit is hard it's hard yeah. to compete because there's more of us as people there's we're getting smarter we're living longer we're bad like but it's like why you stop competing like you gotta find what the fuck you're gonna compete uh, in your life and compete in it that's yeah. it you know so i always look at it like that so i i, I think there's there's uh, always going to be that sector of the individual that's always going to find a way mm. to compete, right? And those are the ones who will get into the positions of like making decisions. Making, making decisions right? and stuff like that. So I just hope the guys that 
and the girls that come out of our generations that are here to compete, mm -hmm. you know, have their head on straight. You know, that's what I always wonder about. Yeah. And it's not looking good. So, <laughs> and it's not looking good. You don't think so? So I think there's, I think there's a mixture. I think there's always in every society go-getters and people that want to succeed. Yeah, for sure. And want power, want status, want money. But, but I think, but that's not most people, right? And it can't be most people because if we were all like that, you know. Well, I think it's like it's that's not the question. So like if 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 all the right go getters get into places of power, it's not so much of like in like public office in general. It's like look at Iran. Like the people are one form mm -hmm. of Muslim, and the government's other form. So it's like we can't be the minorities ruling the masses if we're the only ones because they're going to fucking hate us and not elect us. <laughs> so naturally, public officials dilute to the masses. If there's too many idiots mm -hmm. or people that have the wrong mindset, like it doesn't matter. They're going to they're going to stay in unless we become a dictatorship, which I don't think. No, will happen. I don't. But, I don't think will ever happen. But in democracy, we're going to have to play to the masses or we have to make it a convincing approach. But yeah, there's all these other mechanisms of pop culture and social media and all these other things at play that are really like matter a lot to the ruling classes, mm -hmm. whatever, whoever whomever that is there's layers of that shit too right yeah, but yeah. i just think about that too it's like well if everybody wants it x and i need to be an elected official to maintain power mm -hmm. for this other shit that i like to backdoor and do yeah then my policies are going to support x just so i can remain power i mean i feel that's what it's turned into but yeah this is this is where i think we do live in a democracy but not a very good one because first of all the masses at the bottom are all fighting with each other about while rich people, corporations lobby and and donate to our politicians in order to keep the system that benefits them going. And I don't think our generation is going to change that because I think you can be as altruistic as you want. Yeah. As soon as you start getting into those positions of power and as soon as you start tasting that lifestyle, yeah. you start to give in, you know? I mean, power is refined by resource is defined by resources. Yeah. And so, I mean, you just have to break from the matrix. I mean, you, <laughs> you just have to, like, find a way to where... But this is where people don't realize or know. They live... You live just good enough lives to to be able to, like, survive. We but need to release... That, we got to put some saber-toothed tigers into existence. We need to get those fuckers back. We need to get some people, like, actually like, running away for their life. Yeah, I don't know. I think you're right. I think people live sedentary lives, but I don't. Yeah, they do. And I, I mean, I think there's a movement online to try and like build these kind of people. You Pro know, problem is it's online. Yeah, I mean, you can't hide behind a keyboard. Like you have to be a, mm -hmm. a person of substance. You have to feel like you got to dig through all the shit in order to find the things online that's like of substance and that you can actually do. I think most of it comes down to like, you're right. Like something that feels, you know, mm -hmm. because I still think hide, hiding behind the internet or layers is still, uh, mm -hmm. potentially not the hardest thing you can do. Right. But, but those are the idiots, the ones that just sit there and comment and complain online. Oh dude. It's just, well, the, I, it's, 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 we're still in a lot of ways animals oh yeah so we're still wanting to go through the realms of emotions mm -hmm. we still have that we still are very you know animalistic so i think for it's like rooting for a sports team it's it's this tribalism that tribalism. always exactly comes into is. play and i think you know that's our that's that is what built humanity mm -hmm. tribes but also because it's so ingrained in our dna it's going to all it, it's it's a mechanism to tear the tear it apart yeah so you know i think i don't know i don't know what people are going to do or what it's going to look like in a lot, in yeah, a lot of years we, but. we have evolved in small groups and now that we are large societies i don't think humans have the evolutionary brain to think on scales that big because mm. our brains are more for like you care mostly for your family first yourself yourself but also for your family like yeah. if you had a family you'd care for them oh, of, course. of course that's part yeah, of me you it's would myself. basically be it would be like almost like socialist communism in your you, house right you, you would are, give them whatever they want they don't have to give you anything yeah but i mean that's 
that's how your perception of it. A lot of people have lives and families and part mm-hmm. of families where that's not the case, where the head of the household. Oh, yeah, so I of think course. That, I think there's, there's like that inherent biological approach to it. Mm-hmm. But then there's also like the, this realm of, of like non, no consequences that allow mm-hmm. other things and, and other, like literally government perpetuated mm-hmm. that through a welfare state as well. Uh-huh. So like there's ways to break the DNA code that we have. You just need to find that layer of support from somewhere else and if it's yeah. attainable, you know? Of course, like not everyone is gonna be like that. Like this is why women are so picky is because there's so many times <laughs> a man can just impregnate a woman and dip, right? I mean, I guess but that's I, part of it too, yeah. This is, But this is also why we have laws that say, okay, if you're gonna do that, you're gonna pay, you know? I mean, but it's not about the monetary approach. It's about the fundamentals of a family and raising that individual. We should incentivize families to stay together. Correct. Because that's what, so like going like, you know, just full, like full circle on the conversation. It just, Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm I'm really have a, have a little, have a skeptical outlook to to how our, our, yeah, how things are going to go. Yeah. I, I, I will say that like the family unit and I, I talked to my dad about this. He talks about it a lot. The family unit is kind of like not there anymore. Like there's a lot of people oh. saying you don't need to get married. You don't need to have kids. And our generation is like, dude, it's terrible. We're having less and less kids. It's terrible. You know, yeah. like our replacement rate is super I, low. Well, I think right now it's okay in the United States, but it's dropping. Yeah. yeah. And no, eventually it I will mean, drop. Trends, trends. It's, it's, it's going to be it's less trending less. down. Yeah. I don't know. I hope the pendulum swings. I really think that like, <laughs> like the internet, the, the, uh, internet, you said like we weren't built for scale as like a human brain. You mentioned that. Yeah. Well, the internet allowed all these subsets and subcultures and all these people to, to find like, yeah, people like themselves and to believe and normalize certain things. Mm-hmm. And this is where that tribalism comes in. Well, yeah, because like, now they have their tribe, but it's online. So it's yeah, online. everybody interact mm-hmm. with no one likes to, you know, do like mm-hmm. dress up like animals and shit or whatever. <laughs> but like, I know somebody over there does someone. So we're going to aggregate together yeah. in a common place. And that's going to stimuli this, mm-hmm. this thing that I like. Yeah. So I think that's why <laughs> so like people are all like, it's like San Francisco is the number one cult. It's like they have the number one cults in the world and it comes to the, like, yeah, the tech community. I don't even remember. I was listening to Joe Rogan's podcast and like Mark Anderson came on. who's like this really smart techie dude. Yeah. Um, I can't remember exactly what he did, but he did something important. Probably like podcasting. I don't know what mm-hmm. he did. Oh, he, he came up with a, a mosaic. He was in software development. That was like a, a is mosaic a software program? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. I, I think it's a, actually a, a search engine or like an oh. internet browser. Or actually, I don't, I don't know what the hell it is. Holy like, shit! To be honest with I, you. I thought there was only two of those. <laughs> no, I don't know. No, there's tons of browsers. I can't even remember. Yeah. Are you Can okay I, with this? By the way, it's yeah. it's just CBD. It's not pot. Oh, no. I'd prefer if it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. CBD. Yeah. yeah it's not. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, this is something that I don't know, man. I started doing about two weeks ago. What is it? Just it's dosing just yourself with CBD? Yeah, that's it. Why don't you just ingest it? Like through so pills? I, because the gummies, I like to eat it in gummy form. Yeah. You need to eat so many of them. And so that's you're, so much fucking sugar. Like, but, I, I, like I do. I have but gummies there's right there. ways to get it different. So that, that like gets CBD into your bloodstream through like your blood brain barrier. It's smoking, right? I don't yeah. know. The, I don't know. The, huh? I got to, I got to be honest with you too. I kind of just like the habit. Of course kinda, you do. It's the oral fixation that you like is. more than anything. Yeah, it is. I, I'm going to tell myself I'm probably only going to buy one more because there's a flavor I want to try. <laughs> But after this that, is what I'm going. talking about, people. <laughs> we got a bunch of fucking jewelers that are. It's just what, yeah. it. If it's not getting you high, mm-hmm. I never understood that. So this is this is my reasoning behind it. Like CBD is supposed to like calm you down or calm anxiety or something like that. Uh, Even if it doesn't do that, it has like some kind of placebo effect. So it helps. Yeah, maybe it helps. Now maybe. is it good for me? No. I don't, I don't know. I don't care if it's But then it's good again, I don't, not, but I like don't drink. I don't do drugs. Like, this yeah. is probably the only thing I do. Well, so. I can't say that. 
But I guess that makes sense. Uh, I guess your vice is is less intense as. Uh, do, you, do you have any vices? Smoke weed. Yeah. See, I wouldn't even consider that a vice. Um. Like whatever it takes for you to calm down, as long as you're being. No, like, no, I definitely abuse it. This is this is not a medicinal purpose. This is highly recreational, and it's probably a, a, a an addiction at at this point. Yeah. It's yeah. okay, man. I went through that like in college for six years straight. I probably smoked weed every day, and I only maybe totaled a week's worth of days off in those six years. I got you beat, brother. You got more than six years, probably. <laughs> Yeah, probably closer to ten. <laughs> yeah, probably. I, I I don't. I'm not big into alcohol. I don't have to drink. I just don't get the benefit of mm-hmm. it. And as for weed, I think it's. Uh, I don't know. I'm not a naturally creative person. You're not a naturally creative person. No. Really. More analytical. More yeah. uh, problem solving, I guess, in terms of like, I get creative with business to find solutions to things, but like, naturally, dude, like putting up a podcast, going through editing, like the things yeah. you do as like your hobby, like, that's not a hobby of mine. Like, I'm gonna go, like, if I really want to kill time, mm-hmm. I'll go to the gym, I'll go to jiu jitsu. That usually takes up most of my day and my free time, but I'll play Call of Duty because I want to kill, I want to compete with somebody. <laughs> so, like, I'm gonna fuel my natural competition, my yeah. need for competition in. In, in that something you that know? you're doing uh, yeah that's like what so that's a vice of mine that's totally useless <laughs> <laughs> so Dude. this actually where did you get this competition mindset from do you think you're just born with it or i was an athlete my whole life i have okay. no i really don't know i don't uh-huh. know and i don't think and i realized like maybe like three or four years ago it wasn't the winning because like even if like i won a tournament jujitsu or like it wasn't that it was just how much i hated the feeling of losing mm. And that's like, I just, I hate to fucking lose. So, yeah. when you lose. And I lose still. I, get, yeah. I lose a lot. How, how do you take it? Do you think it affects you negatively or does no, it just drive it just, you it to just, like yeah, do better? Yeah, fuel to the fire is okay. the best way to put it. I think there's some losses that we all take in life that are definite, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and you don't come, you don't, you don't ever get that, that back. But it's like, you know, having it or using it as motivation you yeah. know you don't really control what happens to you just the how you respond to it yeah you know so because i i would say i was motivated my whole life for something mm. like just to be successful but i took the wrong route which was going to college getting a degree i think that's working for someone else and i think that's what it is working for someone else is for me I think that's where, like, if I have any, like, anything I'm not comfortable with in my life is that I hate sitting at my desk on the computer all day. And I just don't get, because no matter how hard I work, I get the same salary, man. And then maybe I'll get bonuses and stuff like yeah. that. But I mean, I think, unlike your job, because you get paid on commission or... I mean, I'm salaried, but I have an incentive plan as well. Just okay. as you do. Yeah. So if you hit certain numbers, you get good bonuses or... Yeah, I mean, but the thing is, I get the opportunity to create revenue for my company in different streams. I'm at it... I was like you, so mm-hmm. I wanted to play at a bigger level. Yeah, because you went from, engine, well, software or... Yeah, I went... I was... Programming. Uh, yeah, I did I did systems engineering, integration systems work. Engineering. Okay. Yeah. So I was... Uh, uh, so I got out of college. I worked at Hard Rock International. I worked in like the IT department. Okay. And I just worked on like connecting the 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 systems, making sure the systems are in restaurants, mm-hmm. hotels, and 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 things at Hard Rock did casinos. They worked yep. together ultimately. I didn't work on the casino side, but I did I did a, a okay. restaurants, hotels, and venues like Hard Rock Lives. How'd you like it? It was actually pretty cool. It was actually the mm-hmm. best thing I ever did. And it wasn't about. It wasn't necessarily about my job. Um, I got to work with some enterprise level software, so that was cool. Okay. They had a lot of big, big softwares there and big budget to mm-hmm. spend a lot of money. Uh, it was the people I met because the best thing that happened was that um, it's a little bit of a story, but long, long story short, 
uh, the Orlando corporate office was getting disbanded because the Seminole tribe actually owned us. So they moved the corp. corp. Mm. It's a lot of like the Seminole tribe bought the Hard Rock brand, yeah. but the Hard Rock brand had a board. So there's own executives and CEOs. And one by it took almost a decade or, or a couple of years for the Seminole tribe to kind of take over everything yeah. by removing people off the board. So when the CEO stepped down of Hard Rock, like cafe division, which we were, mm-hmm. it gave them the free reign to kind of just like pull the employees wherever they want so they moved that big guitar shaped one down south they moved the corporate office there so a lot of people didn't want to move with them and work directly with them so my whole network that i learned or that i that i gained and all that i learned in the year because they announced in april of god i don't know the 2016 i remember 2016 that they're moving but they didn't actually do the move to april 2017 the next year they gave us a year notice so a lot of people were leaving a lot of things had to be picked up. That's when I started getting to data analysis. Okay. And then uh, reporting for businesses where I started learning how to read financial reports because mm-hmm. I had to deliver reports for marketing department and this and that. And I was working on these reporting projects rather than my typical like mm-hmm. you know integration shit. Like make sure this stuff is running or help with this support. So that's where I started learning and seeing different perspectives. So like Hard Rock was the best thing that ever happened to me because at the point I started got to meet, meet with like VPs in finances and VPs mm-hmm. in marketing and VPs in other levels which then after it was all said and done all those people like like left and went to work at jc pennies and sea world and all these other major companies because of as the, like executives executives yeah. and vps and cmos like godiva and like just things of that nature so it built my network so strong mm-hmm. and um it gave me a different conversation like it put me at a different conversation. We weren't talking about like support tickets and and this bug and and taking this out or this and that. It was like mm-hmm. totally different conversations I was getting into just with my peer network. And that's where a lot of my mentors are from still to this day. And then I knew I kind of wanted to get in data. So I wanted a job in data, but I never had a, a role as a data scientist or a data mm-hmm. architect or anything like that. So like I had to get a startup company to give me a shot working in data analysis. So they gave me a shot. And then from there, it was even a so even smaller company. Mm-hmm. There, I was like employee seven in the tech side of it. So <laughs> then we like I got to learn even more about leadership and, and, and mentorship and how to talk to the VP of these big companies that we're selling a product to and how to look at our product. It, it gave me a totally different, another conversation, another mm-hmm. view, right? And the people from Hard Rock prepped me for that. And then that's where I got to go, okay, like, you know, every time something happened uh, at the startup environments that I was in, like the, the certain group of people at the top would get up, they would walk into a big room and they'd make decisions for this company. And I'd always be like, I'm supposed to be in that fucking room. You know, like that's what I told myself. Like I want to yep. find a way to get to that room. And I was too young, right? It, or I'd have to wait there for a long time to get the opportunity. So I went to a smaller company, <laughs> right? So I just I just went downwards into size of companies to get mm-hmm. into those positions and, and be able to have those conversations. So now it's like, do, you, do I hate sitting at my desk? Like, um, like maybe, but like I know my job or there's a lot of people that depend on me every day. Mm-hmm. So I have no problem waking up and putting in 10 hours in front of that desk or so you're taking, traveling all over the place. Like, cause it gives me purpose, you yeah. know? So you took the leadership route. Like you, hundred percent, you like yeah. being a leader and 100%. being in charge of people. But I'm not, and... a, I'm not creative. I'm not an entrepreneur. I can never go and create the business and do the work like mm-hmm. that. Like, no, like you give me the business, I'll help you optimize it. Got it. Okay, yeah. so you're kind of like the Tim Cook. I don't know. I guess Tim, you know who Maybe. Tim Cook is. Yeah, but okay. I don't think I'm to that level. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are, I man. Would, yeah, you I are. wouldn't give myself Tim Cook like like accolades. But, but that's but... what Tim Cook. He was the uh, operations officer. Yeah. Before, but um, what's his name? Steve Jobs mm-hmm. was the creative. Mm-hmm. But he had put him in charge because he was like, this guy knows how to make, how to produce a product make it efficient yeah and make it on time yeah like that's where he excelled in so when they you know when steve jobs died gave it over to tim cook everyone Mm. was like he's not the creative he's not the creative Mm. and he's not the creative but if you're a good leader you'll always hire the creative people yeah the right people you know yeah so like you don't have to be creative you just gotta know who is creative and who's right for the job the problem is it's like it's just it's the creative person is my business partner and the counterpart 
-hmm. but that visionary type role needs a strong filtration system, which I provide okay. or business will be fucking everywhere. dude. Yeah. Like if we said yes to everything that a visionary th say yes to, like they're gambling guys, that's their yeah. personality. Like they are betting that this is going to work. And the reason why they bet, because they bet on themselves, mm -hmm. that they're not going to give up, their business won't fail, and we'll just keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going, and we'll find our path through it. I'm on the other hand, that's like, I like to measure twice and cut once, mm -hmm. right? And I want to vet things to completion. And, you know, I, I want to optimize and make our current processes more efficient. And then obviously my main focus now being where I'm at is creating more streams of revenue to the business so we can, we can grow the top line, which effectively grows the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's like, that's my, you know, that's what my role is, is having a vision that's in between the big gaps, you know, because yeah. like a strong visionary can just see the end. Yeah, you need to make sure that you can get there. Yeah, well, like, there's a <laughs> lot of steps in between, you know, and I'm dealing with a lot of that stuff at work now, like, you know, certain partnerships, agreements mm -hmm. that we make and the, the, the hand, the hands are like the handshakes happen, the, 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 the deals are signed, but mm -hmm. the products aren't fully integrated into our business because you should walk before you run right so it, it you mm -hmm. know it's it's part of what i do but yeah it doesn't bother me to work for people um as long mm -hmm. as i get my fair share yeah you know of course. and i'm paid of compensated well because ultimately my job is not to work at all so i'm mm -hmm. using the active income i'm earning to create passive income and i don't really care you yeah. know at the end of the day just that's what i want to do for me i think it's like i would love to not work at all but i would love to work in something that i just love doing right yeah like i think that's what's everyone's goal and i think a lot of people aren't as ambitious as you so like their mundane lives there's there doesn't seem to be a purpose you know what i mean they stop competing yeah but that's that's i don't think it's ambitious it's that they don't like to lose and the only reason why i'm not scared to lose is because i lose all the fucking time mm -hmm. but I you're, just you're keep okay on, with losing yeah i'm okay, okay with losing i just keep coming back you're okay with failure yeah you yeah. have to this is actually something i've learned maybe over the course of the last five years yeah. because i was afraid to lose yeah you can't be afraid to lose anything yeah. i was yeah. afraid to take chances too because of that I mean, you'll get in your head. It's like, even if I go to a tournament for jujitsu, like I can prepare so much and be so confident. Then I'm like, damn, the guy looks kind of big, you know, like that is normal. But it's like being comfortable in that uncomfortable space where like you mm -hmm. don't know the outcome, but you're going to fucking do it anyway. I will say when I was doing jujitsu, uh, it made me, it made me feel comfortable in <laughs> very tense situations. Um, I mean, yeah. Yeah, just like competitive, like you get humbled in jujitsu all the For time. For sure, you, you're never going you're to beat everyone. Someone's gonna whoop your There's ass. There's always someone better. There's than always you. someone better than you. Yeah, yeah, always. And so, but that's life, dude. Yeah, of course. That's life, and I think that's like, you know, I look at I look at that as well, like as as like a legacy. Like your parents gave you an opportunity to have an education, to do certain things, and they pass you the baton. Mm -hmm. It is literally your duty to run the next leg. Yeah. for your next generation that's why i am very like when people are like well you know i'm like said it i'm good here like there mm -hmm. i'm like i'm like man the the amount of sacrifice that not even your family your grandparents generations before that like your lineage has made mm -hmm. so you can have the opportunity you have whether how small the opportunity is or how large the opportunity it's better than it was before mm -hmm. you know to some degree and i think uh um you know people that don't don't find the need to compete at that space it like i don't i don't understand it oh, i mean i get it but i i i don't know yeah like, kind of and that's what i mean by some people just aren't ambitious enough for that like i would say most people and modern yeah. life has made it so easy to not compete because whereas you go on and play call of duty because you want to compete yeah i just want to shoot some there's people on there that they fucking do that 24 7 like yeah. they're competing in a video game but they're not competing in life you know yeah if i'm not winning i'm going on to something else yeah. <laughs> no i mean do you rage I, quit <laughs> no i never rage quit i don't okay. even turn my microphone on i don't even listen to these people i literally go just to win yeah like win a free for all and then just like pop back to work <laughs> or you know do this or whatever the case may be yeah, yeah. as long as you're winning in life i think that's i just as long as you're competing because you're never always going to win but you have mm. to compete you know it's yeah. it, it and losses can be discouraging in life but it's always your perspective on how you approach it. It's and how you handle losses is the most important part, right? Yeah. Like, you I, can't let it discourage you to stop, 
but also you need like you said need to make it fuel for to do better yeah. and to be better and it's it's you know i would say for myself i don't have any accountability like in my job mm -hmm. so like i need to find other parts of my life that hold me accountable you know other than just the p and l and performing and making sure that the company's performing you know it's just mm -hmm. like it's like i have to find other way i have to make sure i'm there every night at practice at 7 45. Yeah. like i have to do that i have to make sure i eat this eat that mm -hmm. take my creatine take my you know my yeah. my vitamins go hit the gym and do these things make sure i walk leonidas around like yola <laughs> twice a day like i have these little checkpoints to make sure your dog's name is leonidas yeah make sure of course that's the best name yeah leo <laughs> for sure cool name. <laughs> yeah i gotta make sure leonidas is good and I, I i you know i have these checkpoints and making sure i have some certainty in my control mm -hmm. of it and you know i'm limited to an hour a day in social media just like shit like that yeah you know if like if if i'm gonna get on facebook it's because i'm gonna read the new updates for the algorithm so i can understand the facebook manager a little bit better Got like it. i try to make myself mm -hmm. have some you know knowledgeable applications yeah. to some un like stupid things so i feel like i'm the same way as far as like all i do is listen to podcasts read books like yeah. i'm constantly just wanting knowledge that's it. Now, yours may be specific to yeah. your job, so you can be better at it. Mine is just general right now. So, man, like, that was me for a long time. Mm. For a long time. You know, 36 books a year, like, that kind of shit. That's pretty good. Holy well, shit. I don't even know if I've ever even hit that, but that was, like, always my goal. <laughs> and then I, I, I kept telling myself, I was like, this is good at acquiring a knowledge, but I need to practice Life. application. So now I'm literally just trying to apply shit that I know. Yeah. And then when I get stuck, I'll go and find something to help me out. But just like just practicing the application yeah. over and over again. So I think that's what becomes most like, you know, intelligence, I believe, like I really do believe it's not anything more than you understanding a new framework and concept and be able mm -hmm. to apply it to what you're doing every day. Mm -hmm. That to me is like how long, how fast can you learn something and then do it. Yeah. Like, that to me is the only thing that makes people smart. Like, I don't give a shit about your PhDs, your degree, like any yeah, of that shit. It's like, if you can learn and then reapply at a fast rate, that's mm -hmm. what intelligence is to me. Like, that's what, what being smart is to me. So it's like, but if you're not absorbing constantly, yeah. like, you're not even going to have that ability to try to apply. So, yeah, it's not so much the knowledge you have in your head, but how quickly you can adapt to learn yeah. new things, right? For sure. Okay. You're yeah. teachable. Yeah. Uh, uh, and you're yeah. able to get grasp the concepts quickly. Yeah, I, I, I do. It, I found it early in my life through athletics mm -hmm. that I was able to like monkey see monkey do. Okay. So I was able to like understand that pretty, pretty quickly. So that's why I kind of excelled at sports, but I wasn't like, I didn't have the underlying discipline to to reach mastery at that which is why i'm mm. not a professional athlete right and something that i did or whatever yeah so a million reasons why i'm not a professional athlete at some point which is fine mm. but i realized i was like oh I, I enjoy learning new things so like i'm a professional hobbyist like yeah i'll pick up golfing and i did powerlifting and just the gym and then jujitsu and i don't even know what else i've done there's probably something else i've done that i can't remember <laughs> um but yeah but i'm a professional hobbyist i do actually enjoy that and it's typically yep. through physical things but then i realized like oh i could do this mentally as well mm -hmm. and then that's when i kind of like started to give a shit about um the stock market yeah or you know indexes and even reading and learning and what does this mean and what do these do especially when you can make some money yeah and especially when you understand i remember during covid when you understand how messed up our financial system is and how money really works and we were talking about this earlier about how they just print money to infinity yeah, they just print so, it yeah you know. I, it's it's like we don't even live in a real world that's why they call it the matrix yeah you know because like i said like money is utility mm -hmm. and we need that certain level of utility to survive and keep breathing and living and the money's controlled so our utility yeah. is ultimately controlled so i just think that like the best we can do is keep carrying the baton for our next family members or next generations to provide a little bit farther ahead of breaking away from this whole mm -hmm. system you know so it's, it's crazy though and you got to learn it to manipulate it and win yeah, it. you got to learn about it so you have to, to be adapt. part of it yeah like you have to be a cog you have to be <laughs> you're right part you got to kind of be a part of it you have to by default yeah. we've been a part of it since the day we didn't even know it's like when you're aware you're a part of it you can start making a plan to get out 
Mm -hmm. But like by that time, (laughs) you know, I had this conversation with somebody about like age, age, just a distance from your starting point when you born Mm -hmm. and now. Right. So it's Mm -hmm. always relative to, to that. So it's just like at what point in your in your like time span or the distance you traveled on earth Mm -hmm. did you realize that there's so many fabricated things around you (laughs) and then when do you start looking at like this is bullshit this is bullshit this that was Mm -hmm. the conversation that we had about media you were like oh uh you know we're taking control of our own media with like podcasts and like whatever youtube whatever the case may be which you know i'm very like well youtube's in the game too of 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 censorship so you know to some capacity everybody has some capacity they once you go public you have public interest you have wall street to report to so it it is a game where it's like to make it like taking your company public is a huge deal but once you play that game you're basically submitting to the masses on how things need to be played and without like going back to my original point it's like well those 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 that play the game at the highest level will find the new media outlet and infiltrate it as well. And they're gonna stay and then we're just gonna evolve to a different one. And then for a short period of time it'll have his legitimacy mm-hmm. and then there's gonna be big players there. I mean like it's it's no secret. Like even if you look at the most popular podcast, it's like, yeah, some individuals are at escape velocity where they they can do whatever the fuck they want and no one could touch them. Mm-hmm. Small percentage, right? Small percentage of them. And then the ads start filling in as a revenue stream. And then the revenue stream gives them money. Their money gives them that life utility. Mm -hmm. So then what happens when all the ads leave mainstream media and come into the alternative media? Well, guess what, motherfucker? You just plugged onto the behemoth that calls corruption Mm -hmm. at every other media source. So, like, this is gone. Like, see you later. So, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. I think there's some because at least the people that I follow on youtube that do news coverage yeah they only take donations they don't take ad money that's cool so those i'm kind of like all right if they're not taking any money from big moneyed interests i will at least hear you out do i have to agree with you if you're taking money from people you have exposure so there's another thing too that you don't have to actually get paid money through like bid money interest or or ad revenue yeah you can also have audience capture where sure you're spouting something that your audience agrees with and if you start to move away from that and say something they don't like they could rip you apart yeah but i think i mean like i don't think it's a problem that there's monetization to it i don't think so neither i think it's okay there's problems with the monetization into as well but the fact that there is monetization in it yeah can cause but this is what you were talking about if you understand the matrix if you understand how money affects people because money is utility I'm telling you, it's it's it is because we have we're biological beings. Mm-hmm. Until we leave these meat bodies, like that's <laughs> that's what it is. We need to to keep it going. Yeah, you know what I mean. So, I think there's always going to be whatever can get us food, shelter, mm-hmm. and the basics is going to have utility in our life. Yeah. Period. Until they start paying me in Bitcoin, <laughs> you know, and I can buy groceries with Bitcoin everywhere. And that's going to be the question. <laughs> so one more question before we go do you think there's such a thing as too much competition or too much ambition to where it could like be toxic maybe toxic is not the right word but yeah 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 yeah, yeah. 100 percent, 100 percent. i think if you're very good in a space and you can dominate the space but you don't have that external factor that checks your ego Mm -hmm. naturally that's what's going to happen you know absolute power corrupts absolute so it's just like yeah of course like of course i mean that that's why i do jujitsu so somebody doesn't Mm -hmm. matter how much money we have doesn't matter how many properties i own what car i drive Mm -hmm. if he's better than me at it he's going to crush me Mm -hmm. and when it comes down to it if life or death he would kill me Mm -hmm. so none of the other shit matters but it uh, yeah obviously yeah yeah so Okay. Well, no, thanks for sure. coming on, man. That's, oh, thanks for having me, dude. Yeah, yeah this yeah. was a good. Yeah, it was good. Worked out great. Yeah. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Appreciate it. Thanks, brother.